If we could please come to order for the uh, Tuesday, January 5th, 2016 meeting of the Iredell County Board of Commissioners. At this time, if you'll please join me in a moment of silent prayer or reflection. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hey, Mr. Uh, Smith. Uh, are there any adjustments to the agenda? I have one adjustment to the agenda. I'd like to add an item under closed session, economic development, and it would be General Statute 143-318-11A4. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as uh, adjusted? Motion to approve. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimously. Um, item five, uh, there are no uh, presentations uh, this evening. Uh, moving on to appointments before the board. We do have a presentation of the 2016-2017 Community Services Block Grant Anti-Poverty Plan by Brian Duncan, who is the Executive Director of iCare Incorporated. Mr. Duncan. Thank you and, and good evening. I was mentioning earlier, it just seems like it was yesterday that I was just here. I'll tell you, time really flies, so we have to do this every year around this time. Um, <clears throat> what you have before you is, is the uh, Community Services Block Grant um, Anti-Poverty Plan for Iredell County. Um, our agency is, is uh, given these federal funds to uh, to provide these services to low-income families in an effort to, uh, to help them rise above the poverty line. And so all of the services that we provide basically are aimed at doing that. Um, <clears throat> just in, as a sort of recap, last year we were here and the amount of funding that we received was uh, was considerably less than it is uh, for this year. And the reason for that is that uh, there are some agencies across the state that either did not use all of their funding from last year or are no longer in existence. So they redistribute those funds across the state so they don't, so they don't lose, leave the state. Um, <clears throat> this year, our total funding allocation uh, will be $319,303, of which $257,175 will be for Iredell County. Last year, with those funds, uh, we, did, we did quite well, actually. Uh, we were able to, to move 27 families uh, above the poverty level, um, the average annual income participant family, um, their income basically was, uh, was $15,086. Uh, that changed from their, the point that they entered the program until when they left. So it was a $15,000 increase. We had 30 participants who actually gained employment 
that were not employed when they came into the program, four that were employed that actually gained better employment, we had one that gained employment with medical benefits, the average wage rate was $9.71 an hour. We had 25 to complete education and training programs. We had five who secured standard housing. We had 36 who were provided emergency assistance to support um, their work or whatever they needed basically uh, within the framework of the law. Um, that would support their goals while they were in the program. So <clears throat> we greatly exceeded our goals, and we're quite proud of that. Uh, this year, with, uh, with, with, I'm sorry, with next year's funding, we anticipate serving 62 families. Um, we think we'll move about 17 above poverty. And 20, and these are projections, 20 we project to obtain employment two we project to obtain better employment, three projected to obtain employment with medical benefits, 20 will complete education and training programs, six will secure standard housing, 20 will be provided emergency assistance, 62 will be provided employment supports, and that's a new category that we have to capture, and 40 will be provided educational supports. Um, so we'll basically do the things that we've always done based on the individual goals of, of, of the participants in the program just to help them really just to gain employment. You know, that's what the program is all about, you know, to help them become self-sufficient, and that begins with um, either education or getting a job. And so that's, that's what this program does. So if you have any specific questions about our plan, our plan was based on a forum that we had in 2014, um, and we... Uh, prioritized, you know, what the needs in the community were, and that's how we developed this plan. I'll certainly entertain any questions that you may have. Um, I had a couple of uh, the comments because some of the uh, some of the things that were written in here, um, I guess as a result of the forum, I I I take issue with, and and, and I'm not. Mr. Duncan, I'm not trying to be argumentative or combative or take an issue with you, but I think the results of the forum don't really match up with reality. One of the results of the forum, they said, local officials impede the growth of the community or economic growth. We have, we have six full-time people that we pay for that their only purpose in life is to get good industry in here that pay a and not minimum wage industries, to get good paying industries in here. Um, that is a huge amount of money that Iredell County and the town of Mooresville and the city of Statesville, I mean, we spent a tremendous amount of money, not just for the staff, but also providing economic incentives to get those companies to come. So for, so for people to say that local officials impede economic growth, there's no foundation for that, a absolutely none. So, you know, wh whenever a piece of paper comes across our desk that, that, that suggests that, uh, I will absolutely take issue with it that it is a falsehood. It, it is, it, if people are saying that that's the reason why they're in poverty, I think, um, there's some uh, lack of awareness of what's actually going on in their government um, is, a, is a big part of it as well. Also, um, throughout a lot, of this, uh, a lot of this document, it also talks about, well, you know, people need to have um, access to educational opportunities and they'll need daycare, and, trans and transportation to get to it. I mean, we call that high school. At high school, there's free transportation. You shouldn't, shouldn't need uh, child care to attend high school. And in fact, um, our two public school systems do quite a good job of not only enabling somebody to get a high school diploma, but to earn college credits while they're doing it. 
So, so like on, on page 15 of 30, it says poverty is caused by a combination of factors, many of which are rooted in the existence of barriers present in the lives of those impoverished. They, though they do vary, commonalities do, agris, uh, do exist across the board in low-income individuals and families. Barriers are those that prevent an individual or family from reaching a goal um, and serve as obstacle to, to them rising above the threshold of poverty and achieving self-sufficiency. They can be identified as being related to a lack of education. And, and when I think of how, how much money we spend on education, I, I, will, I will tell you the ability to access education in Iredell County is phenomenal, is absolutely phenomenal. What, what there is is a lack of a desire to be educated. That's a big problem because, um, because if you want to, at the high school level, you can actually begin to learn a trade. And we're not talking about $8 an hour trades. You can go on to Mitchell, which is very affordable. Everyone is accepted. Nobody's allowed to be turned down. So there, there is no excuse for somebody to say that they didn't have an opportunity for education. I think what they didn't have is a desire to take advantage of their opportunity for education when it was presented, if they mature and grow up later in life after they've been, after they realize that there just aren't many well-paying jobs for folks who are, have no job skills, and at that time if they have already had children and they have no money, then you're right. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a bad spot to be in. But to say that somehow we're responsible for that or that, that we've not provided an opportunity, I would just say that, that we did. They just didn't take ad advantage of it. Um, and, and at the bottom of page 15, it says, this further indicates the direct link between poverty and education and the need for low-income people to have viable access to education and skill building. They do, and I think probably one of the great great challenges that we have is how do we get that message across when these kids are in middle school and in high school where for a reasonable amount of money we can get them educated as opposed to after, after they've wallowed for a few years and then they want to go back and it's, it's not as easy then. So t to me it's kind of like the to me, the focus of, of how do we get rid of poverty or how do we defeat some of these uh, obstacles and stuff with poverty is somehow reaching these kids when they're young enough so that, we can, uh, so that they can learn the tools and all so that they can, they can get jobs and, and not be in poverty. When I read through this, it just, it just basically it, it's, it says that it's really hard if you missed it the first time to go back and get it later. It's not impossible, but it certainly is more difficult and it's a heck of a lot more expensive. So um, kind of the take home point that I've got is, you know, if we want to talk about how, how are we going to prevent poverty and, and deal with it in our community, I would say that our efforts ought to be geared, honest to goodness, at the middle school and high school level because that's where we can deal with it. And, and, you know, I, I hear all the time all we have is minimum wage jobs, and I, and I hate to drag my family members in, into it, but when my kids were in high school, they made a couple of bucks over minimum wage. How'd they do it? They showed up on time. They showed up on time every time they were supposed to, and they did what the boss said and didn't give them any lip, but at least not to their face. And... Uh, so, you know, so I, I think Iredell County and our school systems do give options. And I, and I just, I, somehow that was missing. That, that, those are my comments to you, okay? And I actually, I appreciate those, uh, Mr. Robinson, and I don't dispute you on, on your points. Uh, point of clarity, uh, this program typically serves 18 to 65 years years of age, so it does not necessarily touch those in high school. Right. But we do have another program that, that works with, with the youth as well. So I absolutely support what you're saying. Um, 
it is a great challenge for those who did not get it the first time around, and that's typically who we deal with. Uh, another point of, of clarity, the forum was open to the public. In fact, there were two public officials there. I would encourage you, because we'll have to do this again, I would encourage you to be there, because I remember that discussion around that very point. And basically what we have to do as facilitators is report what's presented um, and not get into debating, you know, the... I understand. Yeah, and so that's, that's essentially and, what you're... And reading. I did differentiate that. I mean, I understand the forum, you were reporting what was said, and, that, and to me that was really frustrating because, you know, we take a lot of money out of the pockets of good, well-meaning taxpayers trying to, trying to get more opportunities here, and yeah. um, boy, that... That just didn't, uh, didn't sit well. Yeah, and, and I understand. But, but, yeah, we had a couple of city council uh, representatives there, but I remember it was a pretty lively discussion around that point. Um, and it kind of ended up being, well, it's easy to complain after the fact, <laughs> you know. And we have these forums like here, and you won't get any complaints, but, you know, in the court of public opinion, you kind of hear a lot of stuff. And that, I think that's what it ended up being. How often, do you have, how often do you have to do this? We have to do a forum once every three years to okay. develop our plan. So our plan is a three-year plan. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're, this, what we're presenting tonight would be for year two of that plan. And so uh, probably November of 2017, we'll have to do another forum. So I, would, I will certainly invite you, and, and I, as I do always, I invite all the commissioners. I'd love to hear your perspective. If I can just ask you one question about where do you, where do you see things going. Do you find the people that y'all are interacting with that, that when they do come and you are working with them that they do genuinely understand that they've, that they've got to do the hard work to get themselves the job skills that they need and, and until that happens really nothing's going to get better. It's hit and miss. Okay. Uh, and what I found, I've been doing this for 23 years. Mm -hmm. And on the youth side of the house, what I typically see is 18, 19 years of age for a high school dropout. Um, you know, it's some, usually around that time, the light bulb at least starts to flicker, <laughs> you know. Okay. And they start to realize that, you know, I've got to do something to take care of myself, you know. Um, and, and we've seen some great successes, some great successes. Hadn't been perfect, but we've seen some great successes. On the adult side, typically those that we get, though, have already been through that phase, have in many cases been incarcerated. So now they're out trying to, you know, scrape, you know, whatever they can to get some education and some training. We push a lot of them towards entrepreneurship opportunities. Um, we do a lot in the healthcare services field for a lot of you know, the, the people who walk through our doors. So it's, you know, it's not a perfect science. Um, and it's, it's, it's an art, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's an art, certainly. And again, I, you know, I don't take it like oh, I'm being no, no, combative. No, no. No with you at all or with what you're trying to do, but, um, you know, the, the, really the message that's got to get out is there's not money. I, I just don't think there's money to present opportunities a second time. And if people are, are waiting for it, I think they're going to be real disappointed. And somehow we've got to get that message pushed to the younger folks. Well, I think one thing that we emphasize is that, um, you know, I think those days are, are quickly passing us by, you know, and, but for those who don't get it the first time, there does have to be something there to assist. And I could show you case after case that if you don't do that, then you're going to pay for them on the other side. Right, right. I understand what you're saying. There. <laughs> Thank you. Any other comments? I think you covered it here. Uh, I, I want to <coughs> reaffirm. Uh, Commissioner Robertson's uh, comments, and and thank you for the, the hard work. You know, if you make a difference in just one person's life, then that has a, uh, an effect that goes forward for many generations, typically. Absolutely. And this is a generational issue. Sure. Um, but a lot of it is based on uh, some poor lifestyle choices. 
when you look at our jail population, uh, and 80 percent uh, are there related to some kind of drug addiction uh, or a smaller percentage uh, mental health issues. That's right. um, but uh, you've got to start somewhere, and Commissioner Roberts is exactly right. It's those middle school kids, but it's the parents of those middle school kids who you need to be That's focused right. on yeah. because you got to break the cycle somehow yeah. and using the multi multitude of uh, resources out there. And it's not, it's not primarily in the government realm. You know, the government does things, some things well. It does, it's not built to raise children. That's right. uh, families do that. Communities reinforce those values. So it's those nonprofit organizations that are out there that are working within our schools as well as uh, uh, providing skills and positive reinforcement to uh, young children that are, are so important. So whatever you can do to leverage those uh, and work uh, in tandem with them, I think you'll uh, we'll be chipping away at the issue. And we won't see it from year to year, but you'll see it from decade to decade right. in terms of uh, changing that deflection in terms of lifestyle choices. And in a lot of ways, it's, it's like turning the Titanic. It's not like turning a speedboat. And, and it takes time. It does. It just takes time. Okay. But I absolutely agree, and we support that. You know, we're pretty strict at our place. <laughs> um, just a point of uh, clarification, I, may, I, I missed it, but you said that the budget this year was an increase, uh, and it was looking at $319,000. That was combined with Alexander County. And then that our share true. was about 250 57 Yeah, okay. What was last year's allocation? Last year's allocation was 252,943. For what? The for, our, for, our, for uh, let's see, that's, that was both counties combined. Okay. So, so our deal was around 200,000 last year. So it's a close to $60,000 increase. Yep. Okay. Yep. And again, kind of for the same reason. Agencies closing down for whatever reason, and then money just being redistribu redistributed you know, to other agencies. Well, appreciate you all, uh, everything you do on a daily basis, and your hard work to uh, move the needle ever so slightly from year to year. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, right. Mr. Doctor. Thanks, sir. We'll now move on to a uh, public hearing. Uh, for the public hearing, uh, we'll hear from uh, Matthew Todd uh, to uh, review the uh, substance of uh, the public hearing, which is to consider a request from the Planning Division for text amendments to the Land Development Code. Uh, good evening to the Board. Uh, tonight we bring before you uh, two different text amendments. Uh, Chapter 2 and Chapter 5 of the Land Development Code. Uh, these um, are kind of a joint effort between the Planning Board initiated and staff initiated. Uh, the first one we have has to do with landscaping and screening chapter. Uh, and what we looked at for this chapter, it, it was a new chapter in 2011. And since then, of course, we've had several years working with it, uh, working with developers, working with individual sites. We've seen where that chapter has worked where it has some lacking parts. And this amendment really is to address, I'll say, um, some concerns we've had over the last few years. Uh, specifically, we've tried to give ourselves some more flexibility uh, with interpreting certain scenarios. So we've added a list of, um, I'll say, exceptions in that chapter. Uh, we also looked at um, the individual zoning districts were grouped into different zoning buffering screening categories. Um, one of them specifically being neighborhood business. Neighborhood business was grouped in with some higher commercial uses, general business and um, highway business. Those G, B, and H, B are, are allowed outside storage, N, B is not. We felt that the screening buffering requirements for N, B actually could be lowered. Um, so we've made that adjustment. 
Uh, we've also made one of the tables in the ordinance just a more user-friendly document. Nothing substance changed as far as just making it easier for uh, a surveyor or developer to open up the code and understand what applies, what doesn't apply. And then our other proposed amendment has to do with our table permitted uses. Our table permitted uses is a, is a table of all sorts of uses that are permitted in the county, which zoning district they align with. Um, it's, it's a very detailed table and it has to be um, as far as um, <coughs> regulating development in the county and identifying which <coughs> districts they go into. And anytime we receive interest, um, you know, th there's new uses that come up. I mean, solar farms, we had to add that one in the last few years. Um, wind farms, we, we, we have to kind of stay up to speed on what the requests are coming to our office. Sometimes solar farms, for example, I think we put that in place three years ago because we were receiving a lot of interest. And we got our first solar farm application this past year. Um, and actually then we had a second one as well come up. So, you know, we listen to what the interests are and if our table doesn't address it, we've got to insert it into the table and identify which zoning districts are appropriate. So under the table permit uses, that was one of the things we did. We also tried to consolidate. Um, there were some repetitions, just getting rid of those. Also matching some of them for consistency reasons. If it was a business, the, the example was um, equipment rental and leasing. Well, that was separate from equipment sales. Well, most likely, if you're doing one of those, why should you not be able to do the other one as well? If you're, if you're leasing and rental, renting equipment, why should you not be able to sell it as well? Um, and under the, the table, sometimes those zoning districts were different to where a certain type of business might run into an issue without that consistency. So we've tried to address and clean that up. And again, the planning board did vote unanimously on these two text amendments. Um, that planning board, it's a two-step process um, for them to review the, any of the text amendments at two different meetings. Thank you, Mr. Todd. Any uh, questions? Was Tom? there any public op opposition? Uh, no, we've not heard any, any opposition. This time I will open the public hearing officially. Uh, we do not have anyone who has signed up but if there is anyone who has come in late and missed the sign-up sheet that would like to be heard on this matter, if you'll please identify yourself. Seeing none, close the public hearing. Um, we had an opportunity Mr. to- Chair, Mr. Chairman, you want to extend or suspend uh, or not close the public hearing, but keep well, it open until the next meeting. We open the public hearing and then suspend <laughs> the public hearing uh, for the uh, next meeting, we want to maintain uh, this proceeding as being open to allow members of the public to uh, take a look more in detail, a rather comprehensive and detailed uh, ordinance uh, to uh, allow any further comment uh, to be submitted uh, to staff so that we can uh, uh, take that into consideration and we will have the vote on this matter uh, two weeks hence. These are on the website? Um, they, they are. They are. So, so all the, the website uh, has all of these uh, changes uh, listed, and, of course, our planning staff stands ready to be able to uh, answer any questions uh, about uh, And I do want to thank the planning board and the planning staff for proactively uh, reviewing these on a periodic basis and incorporating as, as time goes on and specific zoning issues are raised. Uh, uh, you know, no ordinance can uh, take into consideration uh, all potential issues and specific uh, uh, situations. And so when they do come along and it appears that they can be repl replicatable, than uh, trying to adjust the ordinance to take into account those uh, things that don't quite fit the you know, square pegs and the square holes, then uh, that will give the public greater uh, certainty and understanding about what's expected going forward. 
Well, at this point, we will move on to administrative matters. Uh, and I'll ask uh, Mr. Smith to summarize those, uh, all of which were recommended for the consent agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the first item is a request from the Health Department for approval of the Oral Health Section Budget Amendment Number 21, and this is for $1,075. A request from the Health Department for approval of the Evidence-Based Strategies for Maternal and Child Health Budget Amendment Number 22 for $15,000. A request from, public, from the Health Department for approval of a fee increase for hepatitis C antibodies. A request from the Finance Department for surplus declaration and authorization for disposal of vehicles and equipment. And request for the approval of the December 15, 2015 minutes. Are there any further uh, comments concerning the administrative matters? Is there a motion to adopt the consent agenda? So moved. Motion from Commissioner Robertson. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimously. We'll go on to item nine. It's memo seven. Uh, appointments to boards and commissions. Have the uh, Charlotte Douglas International Airport Commission. Uh, Mr. Jim Lawton's term expired December 31st, 2015, and he has volunteered to serve again. Um, normally, as you know, we announce these vacancies uh, at one meeting and two weeks later uh, have a vote. Uh, in this case, uh, his term had expired December 31st, and uh, Charlotte Douglas Airport Commission is uh, going to have meetings between now and our next meeting and uh, are desirous of his participation. Uh, so uh, if there is a motion to uh, appoint uh, Jim Lawton and prior to that to suspend the rules uh, to allow us to move forward with that appointment. Mr. Sir. Chairman, I first make the motion to suspend the rules. Okay. Motion uh, to suspend the rules has been made by uh, Vice Chairman Norman, any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, is there a motion to appoint Jim Lawton uh, for another term on the Charlotte Douglas International Airport Commission? Mr. Chairman, I would move that we appoint uh, Mr. Jim Lawton to the Charlotte Douglas International Airport Commission, uh, that we do so unanimously. Uh, motion uh, from uh, Commissioner Johnson uh, to approve this unanimously. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Uh, moving on, we have a Board of Health announcement. Dr. James Hunter uh, has uh, moved out of state and resigned. Uh, there is a uh, Dr. Tim Burgess has volunteered uh, to uh, be appointed for the balance of his term, uh, but we will uh, reach that matter uh, two weeks hence in our next meeting. There's no action required this evening. And, and for anyone interested, obviously they, they can apply uh, and that information is on the <coughs> website. Moving on to appointments to boards and committees, memo number eight. Uh, the Advisory Committee for Home and Community Care Block Grant. We have one appointment. Uh, Sue Walser has volunteered to serve again. Uh, is there a, a motion? Mr. Chairman, I'll nominate Sue Walser. Uh, nomination of uh, Sue Walser by Commissioner Robertson. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimously. We have, is there any unfinished business? There are none. There is no public comment period until the second meeting. Uh, is there any new business? Just um, if, if I was going to bring up this, the CRTPO vote will be on, uh, on the 20th. So we'll meet one additional time. Um, <clears throat> I think. Uh, you know, the, the last time I, you know, I just kind of told you where I, th I thought we were a bit, um, 
of the uh, of the hundred and forty five million dollars uh, of, of bonus money I thought we would lose it turns out only about 77 about 77 million of that was really for toll road related stuff so so it's not like the the region was losing the whole hundred and forty five million dollars the other kind of piece of new information was <clears throat> the um, you know, if the, can't, if the, if the uh, toll road contract, which so everybody knows, has already been signed by DOT, that's done. But the penalty to break that contract, originally the, the figure of $100 million was, was thrown about. And then it was disputed whether or not that number was a real number. And uh, Representative Fraley provided uh, to us the North Carolina State Auditor had ordered a third party to do um, to do an analysis of what that penalty would be if the contract were to be broken, and um, and, and that ranged based upon how someone might interpret parts of the contract. Their low figure was 82 million. Their high figure was 300 million. And there's a lot of what ifs and we're, we thinks and I'm not not sure and all that kind of stuff. Um, so the the picture is not much more clear <laughs> than when I spoke to you the last time. I, I think uh, we're in a the proverbial damned if you do and damned if you don't. Um, so uh, so anyway, I, I think we ought to all do a little studying and looking and thinking about it. And I, I think it's appropriate for this board to make a recommendation and, and on the 20th I'll vote the wishes of the board. Any uh, additional comments concerning the uh, CRTPO just, vote? Just a couple of points, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to bring out a little bit of the history of this. And I haven't had, I've asked this question several times. I, times and I have not received at least in my mind is a clear answer how binding legally administratively or, or whatever is any vote held by the Charlotte Regional Transportation Organization Do, does it have any weight or is it a mere <coughs> recommendation does any, can anybody answer that question it, at this point I mean the CRTPO did not sign the contract. North Carolina Department of Transportation signed the contract. <clears throat> so um, when the governor asked that we read that CRTPO come back and give it a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down vote, I, I think he's doing that to get input to direct NCDOT to break the contract or not break the contract or at least consider it. But CRTPO at this point can't vote and break the contract. Only the state, only the state can. So no, no action there they take <clears throat> binds anyone to follow their direction. They're just merely it's merely going to be a recommendation to the DOT. Yeah, that that's the way that's the way that I understand it. And oh, I forgot to mention. I, I think the last time we talked, there was some question about this the the penalty. <clears throat> Could the penalty be assessed to the members of the CRTPO, which would mean if it's a $200 million penalty, then does Iredell County have to write a check for that portion? And as I, as I understand it, and as Representative Fraley understands it, that would not, member governments would not be held liable. It would come out of our transportation funds, but it wouldn't come from Iredell County's general fund, so to speak. So basically, they would just starve us until they recoup their penalties. That is correct. We'll do a mistake. We'll pay it now. Well, no. But still, at that point, we're, 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 we're just. I'm concerned if, if 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 we don't that if it does go forward, what's this whole deal going to cost the North Carolina taxpayers in the long run? Or 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 it, would it not be? A bad deal is a bad deal. I guess uh, I've always lived by the, by the premise that if you 
found yourself in a hole, you need to stop digging and continuing on with this contract. Looks like you're still continuing to dig yourself into a hole. Well, I think I think it's instructive that the the analysis done by the state auditor's office simply looks at the pretty much a worst case scenario relative to cancellation from both a payment to uh, the uh, contractor as well as something that I don't think we were really aware of was that there is a uh, bond that has been backed by the state of North Carolina or authorized for tax exempt status which has been sold to uh, subscribers who uh, as a result of canceling this if you cancel that bond they are third parties they had anything to do with this negotiation they just invested and that they would be entitled to a recoupment of uh, uh, interest that they would have earned and so on uh, so that's about 82 million dollars on top of the 300 million dollars for the worst case now uh, in fairness there is litigation that is pending uh, in the courts uh, <coughs> that challenges whether or not uh, the uh, Department of Transportation exceeded its legal uh, authority and uh, constitutional parameters uh, impinged on the legislature in some way in terms of some of the terms of this contract. Um, the reality is, uh, as has been noted, CRTPO is not a dispositive body in this case. They are making, giving a sense of, of uh, public sentiment, which we have to assume will be, uh, at, at the word take, if you're going to ask for that, presumably you're going to act upon it, uh, unless they just don't expect <coughs> us to ask the wrong way. Um, in terms of the voting on the CRTPO, uh, the city of Charlotte, that one body out of 68 votes controls 31. So there are enough individual towns that are, have either staked themselves out against or for the uh, moving forward that if Charlotte votes one way or the other, that's the way it's going to go. And what we do or don't do, whichever way we vote, will not substantively have an impact. Uh, the city of Charlotte will be making that decision at a city council meeting coming up this coming week and recently had a committee meeting where they voted three to two to proceed forward. Um, how that might turn out, you know, is anybody's guess, I suppose. Um, but what they haven't done in this analysis is what I think uh, Commissioner Bowles was touching on is that uh, there's, uh, there are opportunity costs to moving forward with this 50-year locked-in contract which limits the ability to uh, develop a road net that impinges in any way on the total uh, road usage. So any relief valves for the 95% of people that you know can't afford to use a toll road um, are essentially blocked uh, for 50 years. Uh, the the cost of that is uh, highly speculative, but my guess is that 50 years hence, if you look back, $382 million will seem insignificant in comparison. Uh, nonetheless, uh, you know, we are where we are. This, this county commission has gone on record uh, as a body requesting uh, the governor and Department of Transportation back before the final uh, extension was granted and, and a deal signed uh, to uh, hold off to 
allow more time to do due diligence and to understand the second and third order effects and uh, try to resolve some of the uh, unknown unknowns and put them in the known category. Uh, but within the week of our passing that resolution, uh, this contract was executed in its final form. And of course, since then, uh, there's been uh, work actually commenced, which is dollars that are gonna be recouped, <laughs> uh, no matter what happens. So, um, <clears throat> we are uh, going to vote and I will say that the CRTPO did have a vote concerning the prioritization 4.0, which is a list of future projects. And, and, and in that process, there was uh, a vote that uh, gave, it was to give a sense of, okay, do we support going forward with the toll road process? And uh, Iredell County, uh, I can say as representative of this body, I voted against the total proceeding. Uh, so uh, we'll see two weeks hence and after City of Charlotte has staked themselves out uh, on how things uh, may lie. But uh, it is not a pleasant place to be in for the, for the uh, Charlotte region nor the state. I, think. I, I would say that most of the, um, you know, over the many years that we've talked about this, I mean, the state never misrepresented. They always said it was going to be a managed lane. It wasn't going to be, you know, eight lanes and everybody drives through and throws their two quarters in the basket and they keep going, you know, like the, the, the toll roads of, of, of 10 or 20 years ago. Um, and, and, and even though nobody wants to pay to drive on a road, I think that there was some degree of, of, um, of acceptance that to get 77 wide, we might have to pay some tolls. What, what has kind of burned everybody is that the toll will only be one lane, and, um, and in order to keep people on that lane, you, in order for people to get and pay the toll on that one lane, the traffic has to be bad in the remaining lanes, and that the contract was for 50 years. I think that's, that's the part that just stuck everybody the wrong way, the worst. I think that's what the public kind of um, connect, uh, connected into. So, uh, so, you know, it wasn't that we were against having to pay something, but it was that we were basically guaranteeing ourselves traffic for 50 years. I think that's, that's what got everybody um, concerned, and I think that's what all of us are looking at is what's really the cost over this over this 50-year period. So, anyway, tough spot. We're in a tough spot. Well, the the thing that has me perplexed about the whole matter is this commitment to tolls seems to transcend partisan politics. In February. Of 2011, Frank Mitchell, Mitchell and I were summoned to Morsel to meet with representatives of the DOT. This was nearly two years before Pat McQuarrie went into office. We were told in that meeting that the toll road project was a done deal. Hmm. It, there was no way to stop it, that the leadership of the state was committed to it. <clears throat> that the hope was it would have free up revenues for other projects in, the in our transportation district. I asked the question, what type of project specifically are we speaking of? And they begin to talk about interchanges. They begin to talk about uh, improving major arteries, feeding out to the 77 car. And I asked, I was asked specifically what it would take for Iredell County not to be against, not to speak out against the toll. And I said, well, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Now, bear in mind, this was well before the average citizen knew that the tolls were a certainty. 
because that was the first time that I as a commissioner at, at that time of what, 15 years was aware that it was a certainty. So I asked the representatives of the DOT that perhaps Iredell County would not make it so difficult for them politically if they could commit to put an interchange at Cornelius Road and Jane Sowers Road since the toll would free up discretionary money for other development projects. Frank Mitchell and I left that meeting with a pretty substantial commitment, I felt like, that those two projects, particularly the interchange at Cornelius Road, would be accelerated. Subsequent to that, it was put in the next tip plan. And work was begin in 2019. That doesn't seem like a big victory, but that's such a perception is held by novices who've never dealt with the DOT. That was an extraordinary commitment. Well, then the administration changes. And there was a reform of the DOT. <coughs> well, the... The only, reforming the DOT is a whole lot like hitting your pillow. You wear yourself out, but the pillow doesn't change. It's, it still has distortions in it. They're just different. Well, they changed the scoring methodology for projects. When they changed the scoring methodology for projects, guess what happened to Cornelius Road and Jane Sowers Road? They got scuttled. Those projects were out of the plan. Now, subsequent to that, through some of the work of our legislators, there is a possibility that, that they may be put in. That is why I asked the question, to what degree is any action taken by the CRTPO binding? Because if it's not, and the commitment to tolls transcends political partisanship, and this whole process is probably superfluous. It's going to happen regardless of what anybody does. Because in 2011, we were told that this commitment had been made long ago. How long before 2011? I don't know. But that commitment was there from previous administrations of a different political persuasion. But it persists even to today. So... I think perhaps they may have us all dancing on the head of a pen for no good reason. It makes a little difference what we do other than fairly represent the opinions of the people who elected us. So, my two cents worth. Pass the hat. Collect any more? <laughs> Penny for your thoughts? Okay. Any further comments or questions? or? So basically the reality is the Charlotte area and two other jurisdictions, if they go one way, it's irrelevant what we're doing. Yeah. yeah. Like the, the three additional votes? Yeah, the, and, and a lot of those are towns that are either in Union County or bordering I-85. I mean, the, the, I, I made a commitment that I wouldn't give them a rough time if we got those two interchanges. Well, they reneged on that. I never committed it. But I would not question the wisdom of the scoring methodology for transportation projects. So I'm not breaking a promise when I say this. I said in a meeting at the Statesville Regional Airport one day when the DOT made the first presentation that I was aware of in this district as how transportation projects were going to be scored. They made the statement that this was the first time that aviation or service transportation products were lumped into the same thing in the same bundle of money. It was the first time that road money and recreational money was put in and scored by the same method. And they, said, they said it's the first time it's ever been tried. And I remember telling the gentleman, I said, there's probably a good reason it's never been tried because it's stupid. How can you how can you fairly judge 
between a bike path and a highway as it relates to economic impact to a community. If some garden club in Davidson wants a bike path, then let a garden club in Davidson buy a bike path. But if you're going to put additional lanes on the interstate highway or you're going to put an interchange, there's no comparison to the economic benefit of that, not just to the state, but perhaps, depending on where it's located, a region. So in an attempt to reform something, I think it's just as messed up as it was before. If you want to spend some money on bike paths, Spend money on bike paths if you, and let them compete from that pool of money, but don't make everything compete together. The old saying, give me a mile of interstate highway and I'll get you down a mile down the road. Give me a mile of runway and I'll take you anywhere in the world. So aviation dollars are even different yet from highway dollars, and they need to be judged accordingly. And if you give transportation money to the South Parallel Taxiway at the Statesville Airport, in another 20 years, you could have three or four hundred million dollars worth of aircraft sitting out there. But what are you competing against? A bike path. It may make sense to some people. It makes no sense to me. So I don't know that anything got any better. But I never promised I wouldn't whack them on the shin for that. So. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank and you. that was not a handwritten creed, by the way. Right. Uh, County manager report. Two things real quick. Um, update on the jail contract. Hope to be bringing something to you at our next meeting. Um, been negotiating with the architect for about a week and a half, two weeks now. And I expect their final comments tomorrow morning. But everything I've heard so far sounds good. Um, we'll probably have a kickoff meeting with them to kind of scope out the, uh, the A&E part of this in the next couple of weeks. So I'm encouraged by that. It looks like we're just about ready to, to, to get moving on that. And it will require your approval. So, uh, so we won't do anything significant until then. And the second thing I have is uh, winter retreat, February 12th and 13th. And just a reminder, if you have anything you want to put on that agenda or want us to take a look at prior to, uh, just let me know. That's all I have. Thank you. And that's in Aspen, Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we were going to Vail this year. Uh, obviously, I heard of Aspen, North Carolina. North Carolina. Yeah. Because <laughs> no one has. <clears throat> okay. Uh, we'll now move into a closed session for... Uh, Economic development purposes pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143, 318, 11, subparagraph A4. We're now uh, in recess.
Anything of, of any note lately? Well, he's always doing something. <laughs> <laughs> you learn anything? That's true. That's true. I won't waste my time there. Here we go. Zoom uh, open session, and uh, I believe that we do have a uh, motion uh, for economic development. Mr. Chairman, I'll make the motion to call for a public hearing on, ninth, on the 19th of January. Consider an economic incentive of $58,703 for Project Grouper with an investment of $3.2 million in Iredell County. Motion for Commissioner Robertson. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimously. Is there any other business to come before the commission? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn, Mr. Chair. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. <laughs>